satisfaction and black student success the pursuit of a critical mass at historically white universities a book talk my name is Keenan Copeland. I use he, him, his pronouns. And uh, I'm the program manager for diversity scholar engagement with the National Center for Institutional Diversity, NCID, at the University of Michigan. We begin this event with a presentation from Dr. David Luke, our author. After this, Dr. Luke and Dr. Al Young will engage in a praxis center discussion that will address affirmative action, diversity initiatives designed to support black students and where relevant black faculty and various interconnected topics. We will then open the discussion up to questions from you. But before all of this, a land acknowledgement. The University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Three Fires Confederacy made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially as a gift through the treaty at the foot of the rapids. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. And now it is my honor to introduce uh, Dr. David Luke, author of Affirmative Action and Black Student Success, The Pursuit of a Critical Mass at Historically White Universities. David. A native of Grand Rapids, Michigan, Dr. David Luke serves as Chief Diversity Officer at the University of Michigan Flint, where his research centered broadly on multiracial organizations informs his work. Dr. Luke frequently presents at national and international conferences, including the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education, where he completed the prestigious Chief Diversity Officer Fellows Program. Luke has also served as a speaker at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in American Higher Education, where he serves on the National Advisory Council, as well as the annual meetings of the American Sociological Association and the Society for the Study of Social Problems, where he's currently serving as Vice President. David, thank you for joining us today and offering framing for our, our later presentation and discussion. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, Keenan. So I want to begin um, first by thanking the Diversity Scholars Network and the National Center for Institutional Diversity for hosting this. Um, I am not assuming that everyone has read the book, so I want to give a brief overview of the book uh, before we get into the conversation. So first, the problem. Affirmative action was declining at the time of my writing this book. Over the past 20 years, Supreme Court cases, state ballot proposals, and executive order in Florida have pushed or succeeded in banning affirmative action. In 2006, when I was an undergraduate student, this happened in my home state. The university I attended scrambled to try to figure out um, how to continue to pursue diversity. With the president sending a campus-wide email expressing disappointment that uh, in a proposal that 58% of the voters in the state had supported. This led me to question what impact of state level bans on affirmative action might be, and in what ways institutions and states with bans were effective in pursuing uh, racial diversity as measured by Black student enrollments and completions in spite of the bans. So I used four hypotheses to sort of organize the book. The first hypothesis was that context matters. I referenced Stainback and Thomas Kovic Devi's book in Documenting Desegregation, which traces the history of racial and gender segregation and employment in the US. They clearly identify the importance of the political and legal context. Um, similarly, for black students at historically white colleges and universities, I hypothesized that context matters and that states that restrict the use of race would have poor results for black student enrollments and completions. Second, I said that um, language matters. So uh, Embrick, Bell and Hartman, Barry and others have pointed out that diversity discourse has been watered down to become almost meaningless in terms of inequality. The diversity at times meaning differentiating between pet owners and those without pets. The general themes of um, rhetorical incoherence are challenging, um, confusing language that Bonilla Silva characterizes in colorblind racism, I argue is institutionalized in diversity discourse. Thus, I predicted initiatives that lack specificity would perform poorly 
in regards to black student enrollments and completions. The third and fourth hypotheses primarily connect with the work of Frank Dobbin and a piece by McAdam and Scott suggesting that top down programs can generate resentment and are less likely to be internalized than social movement driven programs that will be held accountable by an internal constituency. Some key concepts from the book. Um, I use the term HWCU as a parallel term to HBCU because HWCU evidences the intentionality of the history of exclusion and the more common language predominantly white institution does not. Bonilla Silva and Peoples note the racial character of HBCUs is tattooed in their very name. These colleges are seen as all black institutions with a black agenda. For HWCUs, however, we never ponder about the whiteness of these places. We rarely question the history and practices that create and maintain these institutions as white. Instead, we conceive of them in universalistic terms as just colleges and universities. These colleges, however, have a history, demography, curriculum, climate, and symbols and traditions that embody, signify, and reproduce whiteness. For example, most traditions in HWCUs predate their so-called integration and thus are exclusionary, such as homecoming. Victor Ray's theory of racialized organizations identifies four key tenets, namely that racialized organizations enhance or diminish the agency of racial groups, legitimate unequal distribution of resources, that whiteness is a credential, and a racialized decoupling of formal rules and organizational practice. From my book, I note, we can see how these phenomena happen in racial groups. At HWCUs, we see that relative to students of color, they do a better job recruiting, retaining, and graduating white students. They center white students in their policies, procedures, practices, and programming, such that white students and their behavior is accepted, and other students are punished for things as mundane as sleeping in a common area. Indeed, resources are allocated to white student organizations and offices at disproportionate rates, such that the emergence of centers and offices to support marginalized students is common at HWCUs. For example, at universities, you see the emergence of cultural centers, LGBTQ centers, women's centers, and international centers as an implicit nod to the fact that students of color, LGBTQ students, women, and international students have been underserved by the institution. Indeed, many of these cultural centers have emerged as the result of direct action from students, protests that produce these resources. Understanding HWCUs as historically white racialized organizations can explain both racial equity gaps and what sort of work is needed to remedy these gaps at these institutions. James Thomas, in discussing diversity regimes, talks about the phenomenon of diversity's condensation, where a variety of what appear to be unrelated things are united under the banner of diversity. As I referenced earlier, David Embrick notes an example in the corporate sector where pet ownership was listed as an aspect of diversity. This points to how the word can become so diluted that it's meaningless and that disempowers the word from any connection to justice, equity, and social change. Ultimately taking diversity away from race and racism that was typically the initial basis of the office or work at a university campus. And then finally, many are familiar with the contact hypothesis. Gordon Alport developed this concept and in my book, I talk about it a little bit. Alport outlines four optimal conditions for prejudice reducing contact. When members are of equal status with common goals, performing tasks that involve intergroup cooperation and under the support of laws, customs, or authorities. Um, there's been some debate around that, but some research has verified in a meta-analysis of 713 independent samples from 515 studies that 94% of the sample showed an inverse relationship between intergroup contact and prejudice. And an additional study showed that even imagining intergroup contact could reduce prejudice. So there's some prejudice reducing aspects as well. So I explored um, diversity initiatives, their sources and outcomes at three historically white universities, one that I call Big Southern University, one that I call Midwest Selective, and one that in Canada that I appropriately call Can Canadian University. So um, it's a mixed method study, and I'll put all this on the screen briefly. Um, 
So the quantitative research in this study is, of course, limited by the variables provided from the data sets. Um, and we had some challenges in regards to comparative research because the Canadian institution did not have quantitative data. This study deals with affirmative action and diversity programs, which impact a relatively privileged group overall. So those in severe economic distress are unlikely to be impacted by diversity programs, good or bad. Uh, this type of higher education policy will not have an impact on lower income um, African Americans and even class based affirmative action policies don't address the foundational problems of school inequality, environmental factors, parental involvement, etc. Right, so when we talk about affirmative action, we can acknowledge that it's an imperfect intervention. The scope of this study is limited to institutes of higher education. They're often seen as havens of liberal thought and places of racial tolerance. Um, although events at Mizzou in 2015 and 2016 and at other universities have drawn more attention to how inaccurate this is. One would hope that these institutes produce research and advanced knowledge and would be implementing the best and most effective empirically sound diversity programs that ultimately achieve the goals of a more equitable and diverse um, society. So in focusing on universities, the idea was to look at some of these cutting edge policies and hope that they would translate to other environments as well. So what I did, I um, did a content analysis of 12 years of archived websites for the three institutions. I interviewed 21 key informants at the institutions. And then I did some regression analysis predicting um, black student enrollments and completions. Findings. So first, there's a structural explanation. And big Southern University, as a university in the South, was under a mandate from the US Department of Education to desegregate because they were in violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. The Council on Post-Secondary Education in that state gave specific goals related to Black student enrollment and completions. So substantial progress was made in Black student enrollments from 2000 to 2012, during the time when that university created a President's Commission on Diversity and implemented strategies to achieve specific goals. While the same federal laws applied to Midwest Selective, as a northern state, they weren't under the same federal scrutiny regarding desegregation. They were also taking an aggressive approach with regards to increasing black student enrollments and completions prior to 2000 under that president. And then they passed that process along to the next leader. But they were faced with a negative response and resistance in terms of lawsuits and legislation and a uh, state level ban on affirmative action. This M Midwest Selective is a highly selective school with a legacy of social movements by black students. And that legacy was stronger there than at um, Big Southern. These factors may have increased media scrutiny and negative reactions. Essentially, Big Southern's success was based on an externally monitored top-down approach. So that supports um, hypothesis one for state context, but not federal, as the hypothesis, hypothesis is that Canada, as a liberal multiculturalist country, would have stronger results and the data is not available, but interviews with um, folks at Canadian universities suggest that that is not the case. The quantitative analysis showed that the state civil rights initiative or a state level ban on affirmative action was significantly associated with a decreased percentage of black student completions at the universities in um, big Southern University state and Midwest Selective University state. So this partially supported hypothesis one um, suggesting state context impacts black student completions. Interestingly, a lot of the research on affirmative action focuses on highly selective institutions and, and the effects on enrollments for highly selective institutions with a ban. But um, this research shows that um, all of the institutions, even those that are less selective, saw an impact in black student completions, a declining black student completions uh, associated with that ban. Uh, upon reviewing the archived websites from 2000 to 2012 and interviewing 21 key informants, there was a difference in the way diversity initiatives were framed. The Southsburg plan at Big Southern, the desegregation mandate, had concrete explicit language in terms of requirements related to black student enrollments. The implementation at Big Southern, although sometimes broad and general with language, was accountable to explicit requirements of the mandate and black student enrollments and completions increased during that time. At Midwest Selective, what began as explicit under a previous president became more general and vague after lawsuits and legislation that prohibited uh, specific language. 
corresponding with a decline in Black student complete enrollments and completions. Since that time, some have questioned whether the legislation was truly an obstacle or an excuse to rationalize inaction with regards to Black student enrollments and completions as they declined. In Canada, the language was typically general and race tended to be absent, with diversity often conceptualized in terms of internationalizing the student body. And the third and fourth hypotheses relate to how the origin of a program impacts its success. They posit that top-down programs are less likely to be internalized and thus unlikely to be successful and well-received, while bottom-up programs stemming from internal social movements will be more effective and more likely to be internalized by the organization. The research here conditionally refutes hypothesis three in that top -down, the top-down approach that Big Southern was successful in increasing Black student enrollments and completions. Importantly, this was in response to a mandate external to the university that forced the hand of top administrators. Thus, the top-down approach was effective at least partly due to outside monitoring. Interestingly, this monitoring occurred because Big Southern is in a Southern state that was deemed to have not adequately addressed the vestiges of de jure segregation in the South since the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and was in violation of Title VI. As a Northern state, Although they were under heavy media scrutiny for other reasons, Midwest Selective seemed to escape the U.S. Department of Education's view in light of the fact that the school had even lower Black student enrollments than Big Southern. So hypothesis three was conditionally refuted, but it is interesting that the external mandate was a result of the Civil Rights Act, which was the result of a social movement. So in some ways, we could see um, a social movement being responsible for that as well. As for H4, it appears this may have been refuted. Social movement activity at Midwest Selective was higher than Big Southern, but could have been contributed to more negative media attention. Whether it did and to what degree is difficult to determine. And because the state civil rights initiative seemed to stifle the social movement activity during the time period from 2000 to 2012, and there was not notable activity at Big Southern during that time, the results are largely inconclusive. Finally, the prided position of multiculturalism, I argue, served a similar function to the colorblind ideology in the U.S. that gets heavily criticized by scholars of race. Multiculturalism and the false perception that it produces a racial utopia leads to a denial and rejection of the realities of racism. Racism blind multiculturalism at Canadian University, therefore, although appearing to be color conscious on the surface, serves the same function as colorblind racism in ignoring the way race structures and impacts the experiences of people of color on that campus. This idea of racism blind multiculturalism certainly warrants more development, but that's one additional finding. So implications, context matters, but context can also be used as an excuse. Other public flagships and states with affirmative action bans did not see the same declines in black student enrollments and completions as Midwest selective. Other factors like selectivity, media scrutiny, are certainly germane to the issue, but the sincerity of intentions of top administrators at MSU was difficult to assess from the research and questioned by some of the people that I interviewed. And the possibility that their efforts were lacking and insincere is still open and may have some explanatory power in de determining the decline in Black enrollments and completions. External mandates can be effective. While research shows that mandatory diversity trainings can be counterproductive and generate resentment among employees at a firm, Statewide mandates have the power to force the hand of administrators and employers in generating real change. High levels of selectivity and a highly socially valued degree, high media scrutiny and social movement activity all may have played a role in working against Midwest Selective as compared to Big Southern. And finally, the lack of data in the Canadian institution and Canadian universities broadly conceals racial disparities in enrollment, completion, and other data. While multiculturalism on the surface appears to contrast color blindness by being more color conscious, the prided position of multiculturalism associated with a lack of tracking race data for students in Canada likely serves as a parallel purpose to color blindness in preserving the racial status quo and reproducing racial inequality. All right, let's talk. I'd like to invite Dr. Colquitt back. David, thank you so much for um... For that framing. I'm looking forward to this discussion. And with that, I will introduce Dr. Al Young. Al Young Jr. is the University Diversity and Social Transformational Change Professor, uh, Edgar Epps Collegiate Professor of Sociology, 
Ah, he's a professor in African American and African Studies, Gerald R. Forbes School of Public Policy, uh, University of Michigan. I, I think we got everything but engineering. This guy is everywhere. His primary area of research focuses in on low income uh, African American men. Uh, particularly how they construct understandings of various aspects of social reality. His books include The Minds of Marginalized Black Men, Making Sense of uh, Mobility, Opportunity, and Future Life Changes. His second book, Are Black Men Doomed? And his last, or just most recent, From the Edge of the Ghetto, African Americans and the World of Work. Al, thanks for joining us today. Dr. Polka, it's my pleasure. It's great to be here. And I am particularly excited by this conversation. Uh, Dr. Lucas brought a tremendous array of data to the issue of what has gone on around affirmative action. And our conversation today will try to push us forward. We're going to try to look at what, what should go on uh, moving forward, given the important uh, work that he's uh, shared with us. But before jumping into that, I, I feel compelled to ask Dr. Luke to uh, address a point he makes quite early in his book. And that has to do with your discussing how your racial background is not often, but people assume your racial background to be something different than, than what it happens to be. And I'm curious if you can say a little bit more about why you feel that's important for readers to know um, as you produce this work, what does it mean about how you confront the issues in the work that you've pursued? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so, um, Early in the book, as I'm talking about the research methods, I disclose my multiracial ancestry as part of the positionality section. Um, I think it's important because there are times um, when doing the interviews, when the perception of shared ancestry or some element of shared experience might impact what someone is comfortable or willing to say or not. Uh, as I note in the book, my father is Indian, my mother is white. And although I am half white, I'm not often viewed as a white guy. Um, this came up when I was interviewing um, white interviewees and I could see some discomfort at times with um, encroaching into conversations around race. Um, and it was, uh, there were a couple moments that it was particularly evident. My own ancestry also, on another note, helped me learn to be more curious and learn more about race and racism. And I found in studying sociology, a language and a structure to better articulate and understand things I had casually observed. So in this way, my life, was a training to be attuned to racial dynamics in some ways that made me feel a level of confidence going into interviews that I'd be able to sense those dynamics and try to work through them to, to um, really um, get good data. And uh, finally, I'm also sometimes mistaken for being Black, and doing a book about Black student success could contribute to that confusion. Um, but as you know, when you study race and racism in the US, Anti-Black racism is worth focused attention, and we're thinking about um, admissions at historically white colleges and universities, and I was thinking, how do I conceptualize what an effective diversity initiative is? Many of these traced back to um, efforts to try to integrate um, these institutions, and so focusing on Black student enrollment and completion seemed to make sense to me. So, um, but, you know, it was, it, the disclosure of my own race was primarily because that's something that that came up in the interviews. Um, you know, I didn't typically disclose my race during the interview, um, but I could sort of feel how that was impacting the dynamic. I find it interesting that there's both lessons to be learned about who you are and, and how that mattered for your interaction with people but how that matters for how you thought about the phenomena that, that you're studying. And, and in some sense, that disclosure of identity reminds me that you're in some ways a case example of the effect you're trying to study. Um, the fact that you represent difference, you can be misperceived in so many ways, but that still triggers your own interest in the topic and your own ability to think about some of the questions you wanted to pursue. So you being a different person coming into this space exemplifies in a lot of ways that great struggle we have in trying to make sense of difference in higher ed, difference in society. Um, I want to turn a bit to the, the work itself. And you've walked us through all of the uh, complications that are involved in studying these four hypotheses, 
I think in the world of research, we like to prove or disprove hypotheses and, and get on with arguing why and how that happens and that that constitutes good research. Here you add a great deal of nuance and context to every hypothesis you explore. Um, you've walked us through some of that. You've given us some basis as to why that's the case. I wonder if you can share in this space what we can take from this analysis that basically says the complexity is even more complex. <laughs> What can we take from this to, to help us move forward in producing effective change in higher education for black students, for underrepresented students? Well, th thank you. I I mean, it's interesting as you led up from that, I started to get a little bit offended because you're saying that, you know, science is when we have hypotheses and then we have uh, clear results, right? Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I it, it is messy. Um, I have a few takeaways from the book and from the process of producing it. Some of them affirm some things we already know, like it's important to have assigned responsibility to a task force or a staff person, have specific goals and metrics and hold people accountable to that. And so I think, you know, part of my background prior to academia was accounting and in and, and auditing, they talk about the tone at the top of an organization, right? And that sort of sets the tone and in and, and that context as regard to financial internal controls. But here, I think the tone at the top matters a lot. Um, and external mandates can be effective in that way. I think uh, we have an interesting opportunity right now with Title VI. There's an increased level of attention to Title VI. Um, University of Pennsylvania is opening a Title VI center similar to Title IX offices across the country. And Title VI is also what was referenced by the Council on Post-Secondary Education for big Southern universities um, in setting their goals. Title VI prohibits discrimination based on race, color, and national origin. Over the summer, University of Michigan had some Office of Civil Rights complaints related to Title VI and ensuring sufficient effort to prevent a hostile environment with regards to race, color, and national origin. So we see these anti-DEI forces and they're pretty loud, right? Um, on the other hand, this is effectively a mandate. Um, we cannot allow there to be a hostile environment with regard to race, color, or national origin or shared ancestry. So Big Southern was under this desegregation mandate by the state and the institution responded with action that demonstrated results. How can we provide evidence that we're preventing a hostile environment? And I think of this as similar to when affirmative action came out, it was an executive order in 1961 and federal contractors were to take affirmative action to ensure they weren't discriminating. Nobody knew what that meant. So human resources offices and personnel experts decided that they would take the reins and do things that would demonstrate that they were taking affirmative action. So formalized job descriptions and hiring processes and things like that. Um, well, what does it mean to prevent a hostile environment with regards to race? Can we define that? Is this an opportunity for us to try to define that? Um, Another takeaway I had was the Canadian case, which was kind of an oddball in here because of the lack of data. Um, Canada is very proud of this national position of multiculturalism, but it shielded them in some ways from exposing re racial inequities because they weren't collecting data. I talked to people at Canadian University. I talked to a, um, a faculty member that told me about a Muslim student who was assaulted in the street. Um, their hijab was taken. Um, I talked to a black uh, staff person who talked about going to a local pub and people touching her hair without her consent. Um, so, you know, these are the same sorts of things that we hear about in the US, um, in spite of being a multiculturalist place. So I kind of think their position of multiculturalism, while it might be aspirational, is in some ways declaring mission accomplished too soon, right? And so we don't have the data to say that we have the same problems as the US. So we're just gonna say that we don't, right? Um, so my advice from that is don't do that, right? Um, but th those are just a couple kind of quick, um, quick uh, takeaways that I had from it. Well, I, I, I get the sense given what you said that certainly measurement and documentation matter even in the face of people that say too much, why well, pay so much attention? Your Canadian case, as you argued, seems to reveal to us that if you don't document, you miss 
uh, awareness but, of what precisely is going on on the ground. And here's the here's the the challenge though of the um, political context, which now you know the the state context that uh, Midwest Selective was in is now basically all of our context after the Supreme Court ruling. Um, critical mass. Um, so I was authoring a um, strategic action plan for diversity for the University of Michigan Flint, and critical mass was the language that I had to use. We are going to try to pursue a critical mass of racially diverse students, faculty, staff. How do you measure that? What does that mean, right? Um, so we we have some tension here where we know being specific and having measurable goals and working towards those, that's a way to demonstrate progress in essentially anything, right? But we're restricted from doing that um, in this case in some ways. So your comment on critical mass inspires me to ask you a question about definitions of black student success. Right? So I'm going I'm to ask you what, what that means to you now, whether there have been changes in your thinking about what constitutes black student success in higher education as you pursue this project. OK. Um, yeah, I um, conceptualize Black student success, as I mentioned, as Black student enrollments and completions. And I still think at a most basic level, this is what student success is, right? Enroll in a college or university, complete your studies, success. Graduation is success. Um, for me, it's important to highlight that I'm talking about historically white universities, because I think in that context, these institutions do a much better job of supporting white student success as they were designed to do, right? Um, so I don't want uh, Black student success to sound like it's the responsibility of Black students alone, but that it's also a shared responsibility and the institution bears some responsibility, especially for institutions that were not designed and are, un are not providing adequate support for Black students. Similarly, I think Black students and others who hold marginalized identities are often lauded for being resilient. Um, and we shouldn't ask some students to be resilient and allow others to not have to. Um, so to that extent, it's about an institutional failing when we see gaps in retention and graduation rates. And that continues to be, I think, where I measure that. I think if you would talk to, um, uh, there's obviously more nuance to it in, in terms of some, some students will be exceptional students, will stay at an institution and graduate and have a terrible experience. Right. And so I think in that way, the student is successful, but I don't think that's a success story because I think the institution um, has still underserved those students in some ways. If they have to be resilient, if they have to uh, endure in spite of the institution, then that's not really a success story. And that's something that um, my quantitative models don't really um, allow for that sort of level of nuance. I'm going to ask a question that, that, that directly follows what you said. So if success in, in, in your thinking is about admission completion, that middle ground is terrain that you've actually tackled in this book, right? What goes on while Black students are in these institutions? And one of the interesting points that you make in the work is that some institutions promote the proliferation of cultural events and activities as indicators of success. They say we've got, you know, whatever number of cultural events, we've got whatever number of moments of recognition, and that that can often mask the on the ground work around admissions and, and graduation. And I'm curious as to what more you can say, what else you've learned about the utility of those kind of activities, what, what some might imagine to be the very source of promoting student success, promoting student achievement, but that as you point out in this work, if given too much attention, doesn't enable a critical consideration of what institutions are doing to draw students in, to enable them to, 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 to develop academically. Um, how do you counteract that balance, particularly in a world of financial constraint, resource constraint? Yeah, and the, the resource constraint is a good thing because it costs, I pay, it's a one-time cost for an event like that, right? Um, if I'm saying we need to hire um, admissions counselors that are um, focused on going into specific areas to increase the diversity, that is a much different sort of expense, right? But that is also 
a better response for a racialized organization that's racialized as white and that is not operating in a way that is deliberately um, focused on diversity, right? So I think um, these institutions, especially, you know, you go back four years, um, every university had some statement about how they were anti-racist and how they were, right? And um, if your institution was built in the 1800s, 1900s with a focus on white guys, and then in 2020, you said, okay, everybody come here, right? That, that's not sufficient work to create the environment to support the success of all people. So I think programming is a reflection of values and culture, and it can reflect the interests, traditions, and values of various cultural groups on a campus if that campus is diverse. But um, we also see challenges in how programming decisions are made on predominantly white campuses and historically white campuses, because if the decisions are made by a majority vote, then the programming tends to be the kind that is most appealing to white students because they're the majority. Um, and other students might not feel it resonate with them. So I have some conversation in the book about uh, recognition versus redistribution. Celebrating diversity is fine, but not without also addressing inequity. Otherwise the celebrations ring hollow. Recognition, like I said, is a one-time cost. It's a low investment, but it's shiny. Um, so we can say we did a thing and it's, it's very exciting. We can point to it as a positive and it's much easier to promote a program than to fund an initiative to directly address an inequity. So if we host an event and listen to the grievance of black student activists, it, um, invite a big name speaker for Black History Month and hope that we get them to stop asking why black faculty keep leaving the institution or aren't getting tenured and promoted, right? Um, that's not what we're looking for. I think as we invite and recruit students, we also need to improve their support and listen and be responsive to them. So it's not an either or. Um, we're not going to wait until we get good to bring them. We need to be doing both. And everybody has a role to play in advocacy. Students can leverage their voice in some ways. Faculty have a unique position. Um, administrators have a role. And we're all sort of responsible for taking action aligned with the requests and needs of those making the call to action. So I think. It's a lot of it needs to be in conversation, right? How I experience an institution from my position is different from how you do, is different from how a student does, right? And so we need to be talking to understand um, wh where the needs are. And those needs probably aren't satisfied by just doing a program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanna ask you about those constituencies a, a, a little bit more. And I'm very mindful where I sit as a faculty member, um, think a lot about where you sit as an in, in administration around these issues. We all think about university leaders and <laughs> what they're supposed to do as the folks on top to um, advance an agenda. But I wonder if we could spend a, a, a little bit of time talking specifically about each of these categories of, of university actors. And you know, from the work that you've done, I, I understand you, you, you studied students and, and, and the student issue. But given that vantage point, what might you imagine, first of all, you know, people like yourselves, the, the diversity officers, what might they need to do differently, do more of, maybe do less of in their roles to achieve better success uh, for Black students, students from underrepresented groups? So uh, when I think of the, when I think of the different roles of, um, you know, faculty, staff, students, administration, and improving the institution, Right. Um, in conversations that I have with students, you know, they they leverage their voice well. Right. They they um, organize and make their position known um, and they understand that I'm not probably going to be out there with them. Right. But they also know that the next day when we have meetings, debriefing and trying to figure out a course of action that I'm going to do my best to ensure that the response accurately addresses their concerns, right? And I think faculty um, are somewhere in between, right? So, so faculty might be out there advocating with students. Uh, they also um, can um, leverage their own expertise in the conversation. And as, as much as we say we value the student voice, acad 
academia is very hierarchical. There's a certain credentialed knowledge that does get heard differently, right? Um, and so faculty can often uh, use that to help um, advance arguments. And then, you know, it is it is um, ultimately, I think, ideally, there's sort of so. I think that we sometimes ask too much of students, right? Um, they say something's wrong. We we should be proposing solutions, and they can tell us if those work or not. We don't ask them to design the solution or the intervention, right? If we're higher ed administrators, we should know a little more about how to run an institution, and we are being paid to do this, so maybe we think of the solution and let them study for their classes and be students too, right? Um, but I would take um, the critique and, and um, try to take the critique for what it is. If I didn't, if I was a student and I didn't care about my university and I thought it was hopeless, I am not going to put up any fuss about anything because there's no use. This place is hopeless. I'm just going to keep my head down and get my degree. If I'm willing to protest, there's some level of love and investment there in belief that the institution can be all that it should be. And I think that's what diversity, equity, and inclusion work is. And um, there's a tension because implicitly we're saying that we didn't do everything the best that we could. We're saying that there's ways we can be better. And sometimes that's hard if we're saying, for example, hypothetically, that we're leaders and best. Well, so then do we have to get, we don't have to do anything to get better. We're already best. No, we we need to be critical of that. And um, so I think there is a tension and there's sometimes there's a tension with uh, public relations and uh, DEI, right? Because we need to be honest, but we need to do so in a way that we also want to show that we're working on things and we want people to come and be supportive of the institution. Um, but, you know, it's uh, so there's a balance there. I hope that answered some of the question. I feel like it kind of meandered. Well, you, you, you pointed out how complicated the, the, the matter is. And, and as you're talking, it's bringing back feelings that I've had uh, about experiences I've had as a faculty member. And, and the one that services actually isn't so much about being an African-American faculty member here at the University of Michigan, but being called into a unique form of service some years ago where I was an interim director of a student advising program. Um, a program that was actually designed to focus on students from underrepresented groups or resource challenged students, right? The comprehensive studies uh, program here in, in the, on the Ann Arbor campus. And it clued me into the fact that although faculty can be aware, sensitive, responsive to student issues, and in, in this case, Black student success issues, there is a whole arena of experience for students in universities that is hard for faculty to have access to, to, to fully grasp. And at a base level, it, it's the advising apparatus, right? What is going on that involves students being counseled around what to do, what course to take, who to engage, you know, a, a whole arena that is outside of the traditional faculty-student interaction, which is often just classroom based right? And it also means that there are a set of issues, concerns, and we can imagine what they are. I, I, I'm not at all ignorant of what African-American students experience prior to coming to a place like Michigan, uh, what they might experience going through. But to hear from the vantage point of, of, of advisors, particular issues, particular challenges, particular unfoldings that happen for students that may never service in the classroom with faculty, but that drive every part of their experience in that classroom. It's just a phenomenal way of, of, of being reminded of the greater complexity of, of what's at stake here. So, you know, in, in the beginning, you talked about Black student success in terms of admissions, graduation, right? Retention, graduation. Right? And in the middle of that is, you know, what is going on day to day, week to week, semester to semester for students. And at a place as, as, as resource rich as, as, as Michigan, as, as complex as, Mich as Michigan is, the faculty are in a space where we may not be structurally able to grasp all that's going on with students because we're not in the advising space in an everyday way. In, in similar fashion, we're not in the admissions process in similar ways. So all these parties that are tied to success that are operating, you know, in, in the world, they necessarily have to. Um, so for you to say, you know, that there needs to be conversation, I, I, I get that. And I think it means, you know, asking people to deliver a little more time 
um, have a little more capacity to have those conversations. But there is so much to talk about, given the 90 days I spent in the world of advising. That was a little unusual, you know, for, for a faculty member to encounter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think advising is an interesting one because so often um, we see uh, students of color and students with marginalized identities seeking advising outside of the sort of main uh, formal places, right, for whatever various reasons, but we have alternate advising structures built um, to support these students. Um, and, and those people are on the front lines of what are the challenges and, um, you know, opportunities for how to better support those students. Um, you're right. And, and, you know, your point also, these different institutions of different size and complexity, the nature of um, the work of becoming more equitable and inclusive um, changes, the how it looks changes based on sort of the structure, right? So faculty interactions with students at U of M Ann Arbor is different from faculty interactions with students at U of M Flint or at any number of other schools. There's, there's all sorts of um, variants there, so. Yeah. So I want to ask you a little bit about university leaders in particular, right? presidents, chancellors, you know, the, the folks at the top. What specifically would you encourage that they do differently? Do more of, <laughs> in some cases do less of, um, as a way to advance Black student success in the way in which you've come to think about giving your work? Well, I think uh, if we think about um, in the book, what was successful, right? Now, it it came from an external mandate, but it was essentially um, there was a plan um, that was created, the Salzburg plan is referred to in the book, to achieve these goals that were set by the Council on Post-Secondary Education. Um, and it was the university president that was holding folks accountable to it. So the plan itself had, here's the goal, here's the metric for measure of success, here's who's responsible for it. And they were regularly checking up on it. They had a matrix that did, um, kind of, that you could see the progress, where they're making progress and where they weren't. Um, and so it is really, um, the, the, Broader goal is sort of a culture change, right? The institutions were generally created as white racialized organizations. Um, and um, this is an effort to change them into um, multiracial organizations, right? And so that's a culture change. So the, you know, my sociology background, I'm, I'm like, I want us to normalize inclusive behavior. I want, I don't, I, and so policies and stuff will change also, but the norms can be so powerful that if I do or say something that violates those norms, I, I feel an informal sanction against behaviors that run contrary to the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I just sort of internalize those. And, and that's not one person's responsibility, but the president's chancellors, they're sending university-wide emails, they're convening groups, people are listening to what they're saying. And that matters a lot. Um, and then the other thing is you can't just say it. Um, so when we value something, we're willing to put resources behind doing it, right? Um, and if we're thinking about changing an institution that's been operating the same way for 50, 100, 200 years, it might cost something to change things. And so there needs to be an investment. So the the plan itself in the Southford plan was an investment of people's time and effort, right? Because we're telling people they have to do these things. And this is maybe a part of their job, but maybe it's peripheral to their job, but they're being held accountable to those results. But you can't just tell people to do things without also giving them the capacity to realistically do it. So I think there's a resource component and that's where university leaders are responsible for how resources are allocated. And the way that resources are allocated should be reflective of institutional values. And if you're saying that you value diversity, equity, and inclusion, then that should be reflected in the budget. 
I've got just a few more questions because I can tell a little bit offline here that folks are eager to jump in and, and put some questions before you. So we're going to turn to the audience in a minute. But let me ask you two more questions um, before enabling that, that to happen. And the first goes back to a point you raised a little while ago where you said that sometimes too much may be expected of Black students and all this. That, you know, as young people, how much can they figure out? How much can they answer? Although hearing them um, is critical. I wonder if there are any other agents in the process that you think too much is being asked of, whether it's faculty, staff, particular kinds of faculty, particular kinds of staff. Is, 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 are the demands too heavy on any group? Um, or have there not been enough demands that's yeah. been placed? Uh, yeah, both. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, often too much is asked of students, as, as mentioned, and one of the um, possible outcomes of that is that could hurt their academic performance, right? They are students first, and so we need to allow them to be that. And the same is true often of marginalized um, faculty and staff. So faculty of color um, are very often called upon to mentor disproportionate uh, number of students and their service obligations um, impact their possibility of promotion and tenure because that type of service is not being formally valued and recognized. So, um, you know, it's partly a workload issue, but it's also a, if we value this, then it should be reflected in those formal uh, systems of recognition and of reward and promotion. Um, same goes true for women on the faculty as well. Um, so I think, um, as I said, students can bring forward demands. It's administrators' job to respond. That's that's the job. Um, then students can verify whether or not they're acceptable, but they don't propose detailed solutions. And I also would critique administrators because um, we developed a reputation, earned a reputation for using a slow pace of bureaucracy as an excuse for inaction while sometimes waiting for the difficult students to graduate or leave the institution, right? Um, and that is actively opposing progress, right? Because these students are really pushing for improvement. And I think more can be asked of those in positions in power. Uh, I think of the Frederick Douglass quote, power concedes nothing without a demand. And that seems applicable. I think I came to um, U of M Flint and I started as a working in the intercultural center, which was a direct result of student activism and students asking for a space and administration to their credit responding by creating a space, right? Um, but those who are privileged by a system are often reluctant to advocate for its reform because the system works fine for them. So often marginalized folks have to be loud and make demands, um, but it's the responsibility of staff and faculty who understand how these systems operate to help disrupt them. And I think institutions, as they attempt to move towards neutrality, this is gonna pose a significant challenge because neutrality and my perspective seems to preserve the status quo and diversity equity and inclusion are not neutral so in the case of affirmative action it was not a race neutral policy but people acted like the absence of affirmative action was race neutral and that was not either um, that was producing disparate outcomes that favored um, in this case white students and this is where arguments to remove affirmative action and replace it with nothing fall completely flat to me. I've got one more question for you before I invite Dr. Colquitt back to bring our audience in and the uh, the increasing <laughs> array of questions that they want to bring to you to this conversation. And this has to do with folks you didn't study, but you might have thought about given the, the, the nature of your work. I'm talking about alumni children, athletes, the children of high-end donors, those other students, and when I mean other, other students who fall outside of the traditional means of admissions of, in, in higher education. Did you think about these groups in any way, given the work that you did? Did you come to any conclusions or any arguments about how those groups should be treated or regarded in admissions and, and, and student success, given the work that you did? Yeah, so I didn't give a great deal of thought um, to those groups. Um, you know, in the wake of the affirmative action ban, legacy admissions came up quite a bit. Um, to your point, similar ath similarly, athletes are given special treatment by virtue of a skill set at a particular sport, 
because you'll note that you won't get a full ride anywhere for curling. Um, so it has to be the right skill set. Not the right even in sport. Canada? <laughs> I mean, not that I know of. Um, I don't know if they're tracking data on that, actually. Um, so, um, but uh, those related to donors also benefit. And I think those are interesting examples. I learned from uh, one of my faculty in grad school an exercise that he would do in class that I also use. You ask students if they support equal opportunity, um, if they want everyone to have an equal shot. Generally, most will say they do, but then ask them if they are okay with eliminating inheritance, which gives some people a leg up at birth. This is where a professed belief in um, equal opportunity falls apart. And I think it's the same in this case. We're okay with some unearned privileges being afforded to some people. If you use the sport example, I could argue that if I were 10 inches taller, I probably would have gone to school for free. Um, th that's not to say that college athletes don't work hard at their sport, but there's some level of winning the genetic lottery also in some instances. And um, if I were that much taller, my life course probably would have changed dramatically. But I didn't really use uh, these as parallel arguments. Instead, I looked at historically white colleges and universities as white institutions that weren't designed to be inclusive and affirmative action as an attempt to make them more so. Acknowledging the imperfections of affirmative action, I don't think we should get rid of imperfect things without replacing them with something better. So if we're talking about admissions fair, then getting rid of legacy admissions policies would make sense as part of that solution, but I just didn't give a ton of attention to it in the book. Mm -hmm. Sure, then. Of course, I can go on all day with questions, and I also know how to find you for my questions, but uh, I want to take this opportunity to bring Dr. Colquitt back and allow him to help bring the audience into this conversation, because I know there's a lot going on that, that they want to, to have you address. You know what, I appreciate that. Thanks, Al. And uh, I'm excited to transition to questions from the audience. Uh, we invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A icon in your Zoom toolbar. toolbar. Uh, if you like, you can submit questions anonymously. Uh, that option is also available to you during that using that icon. So a couple of questions we got here. Let's see. Because you just recently talked about equal opportunity, this question kind of it's very topical. Uh, it says equal opportunity versus equal outcomes. You know, can you speak to the inaccurate assumption that affirmative action and race conscious admissions policies are focused on quote equal outcomes? I, a person said, I just heard a TV personality bring up equal outcomes in the context of DEI. Where is he off with his thinking? Now I'm gonna uh, throw sure. at both of you every now and again. Yeah. I'll, I'll throw directly at Dave, I'll throw directly at Al, but right now, this one's, this one's an all play. Well, yeah, I, and I wanna invite uh, Al to, to chime in. Uh, my first response, I mean, um, affirmative action um, was this ambiguous sort of thing that was a part of an executive order that said, we're taking affirmative action to ensure that we're not discriminating. So there was nothing really about outcomes there. It was about, um, uh, non-discrimination and about sort of fair process. And if we look at um, research on college admissions, on labor market discrimination, on all of these things, absent affirmative action, they are not um, fair process. They're not giving equal opportunities to people. So opportunity is that. Um, equal outcome, you know, I don't... I, that that would be a, a I think a, a different a different beast, but that that is not you know we we want to give people a chance. That the the issue is it sometimes is hard to um, to establish whether something is actually an equal opportunity, right? There's so many variables at play um, that sometimes we look at outcome data to try to determine if we are also producing the right kind of opportunity. So so. I think um, if we are um, seeing our first to second year retention rate for students and we see a gap where students, black students, as an example, are maybe being retained at a lower rate, we would want that outcome to be equal to white students because we would see in there, uh, you might assume in some way we're underserving and under supporting uh, these students because that disparity shouldn't be there, right? Um, but you know, then that's the the same sort of um, 
impetus for equal opportunity there, right? You're trying to level the playing field. So you're seeing the disparate um, outcomes as evidence of an unfairness there that you're then trying to remedy. Al, you got any, anything on that one? Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to, to to do what what academics tend to do, and and maybe add more of a, of a problem to the situation. But in doing so, compel some deeper thinking. And, and I want to preface my remarks, my brief remarks, by saying that one of the things that disappoints me about interrogating these very issues is that oftentimes people say, "Well, I don't see fairness, or I don't see the outcomes that I want, so quit, abandon, withdraw." I, I find that particularly disturbing because a, as an academic, I'm excited by stepping into things that are confusing, that are not easily worked out, that have no simple answer. Yet around affirmative action, uh, around Black student admissions, Black student success, Black student graduation, there's so much to consider and, and make sense of. And the, the durability of some problems makes people say, well, whatever money we spend is too much. Or whatever we've done is too much effort, too much energy. No, I mean, we, we should be more aggressively pursuing these very difficult, these confusing issues. That being the case, I take very seriously thinking about admissions as one arena of concerns, thinking about the student experience as another arena of concerns, thinking about graduation as a third arena of concerns. They interrelate, but they all three involve very different considerations. Underinvested, in my view. Um, across the higher education landscape. But all three deserve the kind of attention David has talked about, the kind of attention some others have talked about that we've yet to, to, to surface because there's this you know persistent mindset of, well, if, if it's not working, then it's not right, let's go, move away. If it's too problematic, let's withdraw. No, let's jump in. Let's lean in much more than we have in the past. Okay. And if I can follow up, I mean, it just brought one more thing to mind. Um, so I mentioned, you know, affirmative action as an imperfect intervention, but that I don't think it's a good idea to get rid of an imperfect intervention and replace it with nothing. Um, we see, and I've seen this with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, as an example, um, a student representative from a Black student union says uh, the DEI initiatives on their campus are not um, adequately addressing anti-Black racism. Um, there are also opponents in the state legislature that would seek to get rid of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and universities at that state. Those two people don't agree, right? The, the student is saying it's not doing enough. And so the solution is likely invest more energy effort in addressing these concerns. Um, the other people are saying, get rid of the whole thing. Um, but I think, opponents for diversity, equity, and inclusion right now are trying to leverage uh, critiques that are saying it's not doing enough and, and, and manipulating that to say they don't work, so we shouldn't do them at all. Um, so just something I've, I've been a, a aware of recently that um, came to mind from Al's comments. Yeah, no, I, I really do appreciate that. I remember, uh, yeah, I remember that coming up very recently. So another question that was being asked here, uh, considering the fact that uh, H slash PWIs were built without Black students in mind, uh, what is an institutional commitment that ought, if not must, change, be eradicated or included to or excluded to support student success, Black student success? And we'll start with you, uh, David, on that one. Oh, thank you. Um, that's a good question. You know, I, I think... Um, I'm thinking right now, uh, Joe Fagan talks about systemic racism a lot. And in one of his books, uh, his solution to um, addressing systemic racism is a new constitutional convention in the US that's based on the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a starting point, right? And that's sort of how foundational we'd be talking about. I mean, for, for me, um, a a commitment to um, investing in erasing equity gaps, right? If we're looking at the metrics that I was looking at, enrollments and completions, 
let's focus on complete retentions and completions. Are there racial equity gaps? So are students of color um, graduating at the same rate as their white peers? If they are not, that needs to be the focus. How do we get there? Um, there could be all sorts of routes. I mean, Al talked about advising, right? That might be a part of the solution, investing in advising. There might be programmatic pieces. There might be other things, but um, it's it's a, it's a, it takes a lot for an institution that was built and just uh, status quo operation is to support and um, really cater to white students to then um, adjust and become truly inclusive. I I will say, you know, there's there's some examples of institutions that are are different. So I have a, a colleague at Berea College, and that's a university that was founded um, in 1855 and was educating black and white students side by side in the South before the Civil War. And so that institution is built for interracial education. And if you look at their um, data, they don't have those uh, gaps in retention and graduation. Uh, so I think also, you know, we could learn from at HWCUs, we could learn from HBCUs, we could learn from the few institutions that are like Berea that have been doing um, sort of interracial education deliberately. But um, yeah, that's my first thought. I don't want to give you, a, I don't think, thank you, Dave. I want to, you said something really great. I want to give you I don't want to give you a bite of that apple in just a minute, but I, I heard something in there that I, I think we can use to kind of sum something up. So it's not that we're looking to fix the game so that everyone ends at the finish line at the same time, but we're looking at the situation and saying, if we have a difference in graduation rates, this may be, the, this is an indicator of a problem. Considering an institution that was founded differently does not have those same issues. So it's not that we're looking to fix the game where the outcomes conversation is saying there's something going on here. So I'll now I'll open it up to you to go ahead and take it from there. But it was something I heard you I heard you say. Well what what I I will say that that I think sheds light on how we think about outcomes and and progress um has to do with a set of conversations that I think need to happen in higher education that aren't quite happening, or at least not happening in the, in the way that I think they should. And that has to do with you know, putting before us in higher educational communities, a more serious, a more thorough, a more consistent conversation of what we mean by excellence, what we mean by achievement. So all that's in play in trying to challenge or dismiss affirmative action or affirmative action like policies, fall back upon some notion of, 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 of what is excellence as a factor for admitting students, right? Or what is going on in their experiences that, that, that might trigger some notion of excellence or achievement while they're in school and doing as well as they can or not as well as other people want them to do. The bottom line for me is that we haven't thoroughly interrogated what we mean by those phenomena in, in higher education, right? But what do we mean by achievement? And how might we discuss the varied ways by which students achieve in higher ed, right? We can collapse back upon GPAs and, and those kinds of things, but there is so much more going on around a successful college student as made evident by the fact that you don't measure the success of your alumni on the basis of the grade point averages they had when they left. So there could be all kinds of things that are triggering achievement, achieving excellence, we don't, as an academic community, I think, invest in that conversation. It has bearing upon admissions as well. Right? We are still in this mindset of talking about GPAs, test scores. Is that the complete, the most thorough way of evaluating students? We know we need more, right? So we get personal statements, we get other documentation. But that, to me, invites rather than delivers fully on our need to further interrogate what excellence means as a part of the admissions process. What does it mean as a part of the student experience, right? If we attach excellence or achievement to effort, that creates a different conversation. Because I'm, I'm sure we have all had, I've certainly experienced very credentialed students, students that have gotten high GPAs that don't work as hard as they could. Should I disqualify them as achievers? Should somebody else who may want to work harder than them, but not have the same credentials or backgrounds be in that place? 
I, we don't discuss that the way that we should. Right? So I'm, I'm looking for more intellectual conversation about some of the concepts or terms that are driving what are, in some cases, really aggressive decisions being made about who gets in and what happens when they get there. It really sounds like uh, you're really pushing that this isn't a simple problem requiring a simple fix. It's very complex and nuanced. And Okay, well, to kind of get into that, I've got two different questions here from some participants. One is very short, and the other one's a little bit longer, but they kind of get into the same thing. First question is, well, why not just concentrate on merit? You know, the best best person for the job, best person, best student gets in. And the other is uh, a little bit longer, but I think uh, it speaks to something, uh, David, you were, you were talking about earlier, so I'll give you the first crack at this one. Could you say more about the notion of critical mass of minority students and what impact that notion has on retention and graduation? Uh, for example, at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, the percentage of Black students has declined from a high of 9% to about 5% or less over the years. Does this decline in critical mass, assuming that you would define it the same way, makes it make it harder for Black students to persist in their studies to, unto graduation? So um, <clears throat> critical mass, uh, as I said, um, was the language that we were allowed to use, right? So what it means is somewhat deliberately ambiguous. We cannot. Uh, Affirmative action has not been quotas since 1977. It's not percentage targets. It is critical mass. What is a critical mass? How do we know when we get to a critical mass? That is very hard to say. The idea of a critical mass, though, is that you have some level of um, presence that builds like a community, uh, right? Um, and so I think in the in the sense that going from 9 10% to 4%, cuts that community in half and reduces the voice and the ability to uh, connect with people who share some level of experience. Now, obviously, there's a great diversity of experience that people have within racial groups, right? Um, but experiencing the university as a Black student, uh, you might connect well with another person who's experiencing it as a Black student. There are things you might notice. There are experiences you might share. There's a way to build community um, and that can support success um, in that way. The merit question, I'm sure Al is excited to um, respond to. I'll just say, you know, how do you measure merit, right? Merit is so messy and the way that we've tried to measure it has not been good, right? It has, we've used these instruments that are not accurate predictors of someone's academic ability. Um, the the way that um, the University of Michigan Ann Arbor modified some of their um, admissions work in light of restrictions on the use of race was to invest a bunch of money in getting more people to like close read these admissions uh, packets, right? So you can't just say we're only taking three five and above. We're only right. Like a holistic admissions is one of the um, sort of practices that's supposed to mitigate against the uh, bias inherent in some of the instruments that we use. So people are trying to assess the trajectory of a student. If a student performed poorly, why was that? I mean, I I know uh, someone very close to me who just stopped doing their um, homework at one point, and it wasn't because they weren't smart. It was because they were bored by the doing this tedious stuff that was not contributing to their learning, right? Well, then they look like they're not, they don't have the merit, right? Um, maybe they weren't put in the environment that would have been um, the right environment to cultivate their success in that institution, right? So merit is just, if it were so clean and easy, then this would have been a really boring conversation, I think. Um, but it's it's not, I hope. Al? And you've essentially, uh taking the wind <laughs> from me and, and talking about merit. That is precisely one center point of conversation that we need to have more fully, right? So the, the kinds of admissions policy that you've talked about try to be a little broader or try to be a little bit more comprehensive. But I think the question, what does merit mean in higher education? And what might it mean for particular kinds of higher educational institutions 
and why do they commit to those notions? We're not answering that question directly. That's a conversation that necessarily must happen in our institutions. And, and I, yeah, it's not, at least to my satisfaction. Okay. All right. So staying kind of on the same thing. Um, so we have these recent lawsuits uh, affecting student enrollment, uh, recent uh, Supreme Court case. Uh, the question is, uh, how have these recent lawsuits affected student enrollment? Has there been a decline? Is there evidence that things have changed? Um, they, what, what's going on here? And if we're not looking at the right outcomes, uh, what should we be focused on? I know I, you said it's messy. I, I get it's messy, but I can see a room full of administrators saying, okay, we know what the problem is. What, what can we do to address it? Help me. So, um, you know, the Supreme Court ruling happened after, uh, like, when the book was in press. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what I used at the time to sort of predict what this sort of thing would do. So if we looked at um, states that had bans, when a ban got enacted, the percentage of um, Black applicants at selective institutions went down, right? Um, because uh, some speculate the perception of the unfair admission, I don't have a shot now, right? Because and, and this is not to say that I was counting on this policy to get in, but it was this affirmative action to ensure that we're not discriminating was a thing that would make this process fair enough that I would have a shot to get in. Um, the One of the interesting findings from my research, a lot of the uh, research on affirmative action focuses exclusively on highly selective um, prestigious institutions. So this is also where we saw a lot of the admissions lawsuits. I mean, Fisher versus UT Austin was about a student who wasn't going to get into UT Austin by her merit and then didn't and said it must have been the fault of a, some Black person, right? Um, so uh, we can look at that sort of thing and, um, you know, we can see that um, the bans have an impact on ed applications for highly selective institutions, but my book showed that um, the state level ban had a statistically significant impact in reducing black student completions at all of the public universities that were impacted by a ban, uh, right? So this is more concerning to me in that I don't work at a highly selective institution, um, but I need to watch kind of um, our retention and persistence and, and uh, completion rates for um, students of color now, given what I've seen from the impact of the state level ban. And I'll, I'll title this from a slightly different lens. I, I, I'm mindful as you ask the question, what should we do? Of course, I'm an academic. I respond and how should we think differently or what, what we should think about? And yeah, you know, herein lies some of the challenge around how race is, is, is invoked around admissions and, and around the student experience. Right? Today, we're at a moment where, for various reasons, so many students won't designate a, a, a racial category, right? And, and I accept that there are a range of reasons why students may choose not to do so. I also accept that the anxiety about doing so around admissions, I think, is, is quite palpable. Right? I, I come from an era when checking that box was not <laughs> all that difficult a thing to do. Um, today, I think students have a lot of anxiety about doing that. And underlying that is a sense of if I assert or offer myself in a certain kind of way, I won't be seen as a legitimate prospect for this environment. Or that if I get in without checking that box, I affirm that I am legitimate to be here because I didn't affirm an identity. And I think that's very problematic. Let's <laughs> think about how these institutions, and David raised this point earlier, how they were created and what the standards are for, for admission and success. Right? Identity had a lot to do with that. <laughs> I didn't have an extraordinary amount to do with that. Right? We wouldn't have had to have discussions of single sex institutions in the history of American higher ed you know, race-specific institutions, what have you, if identities didn't drive 
what the so-called mainstream position is all about. So I, I think there is considerable anxiety around race that needs to be talked about, that needs to be addressed. I also believe that in, in an era of, of, of racial fluidity, in an era of, of, of new categories, that that heightens the need to pay more attention rather than less attention to race. Um, the fact that people are living racialized lives in such different ways, right? David presenting himself in the way that he did, which contrasts with the way he's read by others, is an interesting moment that so many folks, given the multiplicities of, of racial backgrounds they have, um, experience. And I don't disqualify that being an important ground of, of reflection for the life experiences of individuals, how they've chosen to confront and make sense of, of their life experiences. And it doesn't necessarily collapse on trauma or bad experiences. It's the uniqueness of that experience that provides a lens on who they are, how they think, what their capabilities might be. None of which is in the conversation as it should be because race is being erased from the admissions conversation. And, and in some ways, I think being erased from consideration of the experience on campuses, that's the DEI assault, right? It is in part to erase race as a factor of thinking about the experience of students every day. You know, I, I have a question that kind of gets into some of the misconceptions that you put out there. I'm, a, I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to give it verbatim here. Um, person said they were talking to someone, a, a business student, about improvements made towards representation in the business world workplace. And this person was under the impression uh, that because there are many DEI policies or laws that have been put in place, this must mean that there is obvious improvement. Basically, if you're doing something, something must be happening. So how do we go about explaining the misconception to people who have very little background in understanding these topics while keeping in mind, and this is a, this is another question, is the addition to it, it's imperfect. This is this is something that we're, we're you're trying to do here. And in doing something, it's going to have issues that are valid that we actually need to address. So I... I think um, the first thing that comes to mind, there's an article, I think, uh, Why Diversity Programs Fail. It's in the Harvard Business Review, and it's uh, it's like a synthesis of some articles that Frank Dobbin and Alexander Kalev uh, have authored. That's essentially one of the big points is for, um, and they, they focus on for-profit firms, but the diversity programs that for-profit firms are most popularly institute are the least effective diversity trainings, um, and, and those sorts of things. The least frequently implemented things, uh, mentoring programs, diversity task forces, et cetera, are the um, least implemented. So the, the most effective are least implemented, the least effective are most implemented. So that is a part of the problem when, uh, when the business student is saying there's so many things. Well, the businesses, it seems, are not doing them right. Right. Um, the um, I think in higher ed, you know, what we try to do and hopefully can do is make our decisions informed by data and research. And as a result, we should have some data indicating progress. Now, obviously, some of this is more challenging um, and some of these things are longer term uh, projects that we're not going to see immediate results of. So. We are trying to, at U of M Flint, enroll more students from the Flint area. Um, and so we're making inroads and connections at the Flint schools. The city of Flint only has one uh, public high school right now. And the college going population in the city of Flint is 12%. Um, this is in part due to the history where you didn't need a college degree to get a middle class lifestyle. You work for GM and you're good, right? But so these are sort of other structural factors that make our goal of increasing uh, the population of students in Flint, um, a challenge. Um, so that's one that might be a longer term thing that we have to sort of be patient and persistent with. Um, but ultimately we should be doing things that are informed by research and data and that produce, um, things that we can, we can show. And in consideration of time, I'm, I'm gonna give you all just 30 seconds of the takeaway, Alan, and you can kind of get into your response at the end of this. 
what now? What do we do here? You're kind of getting to that. Where do we go? Give them the 30 second elevator speech of what to do. My 30 seconds, I'll, I'll probably just take 22. And it builds upon what I said earlier. It's a call for rethinking. So even with respect to this last question of there's all this apparatus in place that must mean something good is happening. Not necessarily. We are a nation of laws at the federal, at the state, at the local level. And yet people still break laws. So it's not just about the existence of the structures. It's what's going on. Pay attention to what's going on. Then think about what we mean by the critical terms, achievement, merit, success, whatever, and have more conversation about them in our institutional settings. David. To, to build on that suggestion, uh, it's important who is in that conversation, right? So if we know that diversity task force is um, one way or a diversity committee is one effective intervention, we need to ensure that that's representative, that we have a diversity of voices in there so that we can hear from and be responsive to people uh, regarding how they're experiencing the institution. That is the way I think forward to improve. And so it needs to be a sincere commitment. We need to be willing to commit resources behind it. Um, and I think right now we're seeing opposition to diversity, equity, and inclusion, but we know that we're right, so we shouldn't get quieter about it. I think that's a perfect way to end. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much to our panelists, Dr. David Luke, author of Affirmative Action and Black Student Success, The Pursuit of a Critical Mass at Historically White Universities. And thank you so much to Dr. Al Young for leading our discussion. Please help us build this and other NCI programming by completing our post-event survey, uh, displaying in your browser immediately after this discussion ends. And the contact information for our panelists will also be made available to everyone here. Thank you for participating in to this event. This has been great, guys. And uh, until next time. <laughs>